Melanie Gibb and Zulima Pastinas. These are former friends or followers of Lori Daybell, whatever you want to call them. They took the stand in the trial of Lori Daybell and on display they put the bizarre belief systems and these intricate workings of this group for everyone to hear and I think the jury was like, what are we listening to? In today's video, we're gonna talk about some of those highlights. Hello Sofa Squad and welcome back to the sofa. That's the sofa back there and Mr. Roscoe's over there. Now Roscoe P. Coltrane is the dog on the blanket. I need to change the color so y'all can see him because a lot of people are like, oh I thought he was like the bear or the pillow or whatever but there's a real dog back there and he's holding the fort down and my name's Paul. Now like I said in the beginning of the video we're going to be reviewing uh, some testimony that came out from Melanie Gibb as well as Zulima Pastinas and the Lori Daybell trial. Now the way we're going to do it in this video is we're going to be referencing some of Justin Lum's tweets that he was tweeting during the trial. Now at this point, you can go back and listen to their testimony if you want to via East Idaho News. I'm sure other channels are posting the whole stuff up there, the whole, you know, recorded stuff. Uh, but what I want to do just specifically is use Justin's tweets to use as talking points and things of that nature. Uh, Justin Law, make sure you're following him on Twitter as well as Nate Eaton. They've been with this from the very beginning. Um, and so that's how we'll do these uh, tweets and whatnot. First of all, let's go ahead and just talk about very basic 101 who these people are. Melanie Gibb is, like I said, a friend, a follower, whatever you want to call her, a former both, right, of Lori, Daybell, and Chad's. Um, Melanie Gibb basically, you know, spearheaded introducing Lori to Chad. There's that. The rest of the information will come out in this. Now, Zulima Pastinas, she was basically same situation, but also she ended up marrying Alex Cox. Alex Cox is Lori's brother. Also, he was kind of like the person who did their dirty work and whatnot. So Zulima marries him. He dies like 10 days later, very soon thereafter, um, under kind of weird circumstances. Uh, so that's that. So I just want everyone to kind of know the gist of that. Let's go ahead and put some tweets up. Now, the way we'll do this, because I actually picked out a lot I might just put groups of tweets in the page and just go down them and then stop after a page or so and like really go in depth but I might stop along the way as well and make some commentary and then at the end of this video I'll give my overall thoughts on this whole mess okay so first we have like we'll call it an intro type thing and this is via again Justin Lump's tw Twitter make sure to follow him and Gibb is being interviewed or I should say questioned by the state and Blake asked did you ever speak to Chad about first time he met Lori most likely don't recall much Blake says well what about speaking with Lori about this and then Gibb says Gibb she shared with me that he told her that they had been married in another time period now moving on to number two Gibb says Lori believed this and had already believed believed in living multiple lives before she ever met Chad Daybell. Gibbs says that Lori Vallow believed she had been married to a prophet named Moroni. But Gibbs says Chad knew about this idea a lot more than Lori. He notes, I see Lori turn to John Thomas and shake her head. She's taking notes. Gibb on the alleged beliefs of LV and CD. Now this is Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell. And this earth, you can come back multiple times, but it's different for everybody. Now let's pause there for one second. So first of all, I want to comment on the most recent one about... Uh, where Gibbs says Chad knew about this idea a lot more than Lori, and Lori's like talking to her Lori and shaking her head. You know that burnt her biscuit. And she was probably over there like, I knew way more than Chad. Because I think at the center of this case, in addition to the heartbreak and the horror and the lustful chase after money and power, is that right there is this egocentric thing with this self-righteousness about these beliefs and whatnot that we'll hear come out even more. Now also at the center of this is you see the groundwork that's coming out right for these belief systems of you know you can come back many times I was married to Moroni and you know, we were married in this other life and this kind of stuff. I mean this is heavy stuff to go into just first meeting somebody and so remember as we look at this and listen to this these are people who just basically went into this like oh okay cool let's let's go let's roll with it and that is part of the problem of what ended up happening so let's continue blake clarifies that lori believes she was the head of the 144,000 after meeting chad and yes melanie says and this happened within a few weeks after the two met one juror stared briefly at lori with his eyes wide open before looking back to gibb this is a lot for the joy to absorb absorb i assume 
Now let's pause for a moment. Yes, 100%. If I was on the jury and hearing the details of this right away, or for the first time, like maybe I'd read about in the paper and whatnot, this would be intense. Now also, again, look at the ego behind this. You meet somebody and almost immediately it's, we're supposed to save the world. We're a part of the, we're leading 144,000. That's what you're talking about right there. And I think Lori was drunk with that. Now we're going to cover several in this one. Blake asked MG about a dream Lori had allegedly had. Gibbs says Lori told her she saw Charles and JG had been in a car accident in this dream and that they would not come home by January 31st, 2019. But Charles did not get into an accident. Gibbs says she talked to Lori about this and asked what happened. She said Lori told her Satan intervened, interfered with the plan. Blake clarifies that because Charles was dark, he needed to pass away, Gibb confirms. Blake wants to know about the casting spirits out. Out. Gibb recalls Lori having a prayer, reading scriptures, calling the spirit to come out by the spirit of God. Now, again, imagine the jury sitting here listening to this. First of all, your husband, you're saying that, oh, he's supposed to get in a car wreck, but it didn't happen because Satan got in the way, right? Most people might think of their, you know, a positive, you know, power to be intervened with that, right? But not Lori. Satan intervened with that, you know, or interfered with that. So that part alone is kind of like, really? Now, also here in these texts, we hear about the casting of the spirits out and we also hear about the beginnings of the dark and the light scale and that type thing chad had this very intricate theme for, you know situation or list and whatnot for deeming people dark or light clearly you know if you're light on the scale then that means you know you're better dark is you're evil you're possessed you could be a zombie this kind of thing it's just convenient that people who would end up going dark were usually in their way of getting what they wanted and had to go. Lori is staring at Gibbs. She appears to have her arms crossed on the table. I can only imagine this was just eating Lori up. Gibb on JJ, right before he was killed, Lori indicated that he was difficult to handle. It was hard for her to do that and be with Chad. She indicated that she was going to ask Kay if she could watch him from now on. Kay is JJ's biological grandma if you don't know the case. Now here I think this is really sad because we see where she met Chad, we're going to be the 144, that's the world she was off on. And really honestly at that point she was like, JJ is just in my way. Tylee, in my way. Anything that didn't have to do with Chad and this, you know, belief system they were structuring and doing all this, you know, wild stuff, they had to go. Blake is asking about Melanie's visit to Lori in Rexburg. This was in September of 2019. Melanie brought her boyfriend, David Warwick, and they stayed at Lori's. Gibbs says she did not see Tylee. She asked about her and Lori told her Tylee was at BYU, Idaho with friends. Blake asked if Lori made a reference to Tylee. Gibbs says Lori didn't talk about her much and put her stuff in storage. Melanie saw JJ at the home. She says Lori told her about JJ had an evil spirit in him. Blake, did she indicate that she, what she made observations of JJ? Gibbs says Lori said JJ had become more difficult. His speech was more intelligent and in that he said, I love Satan. Gibb says Lori told her JJ would climb up on the fridge and was changing. Now that part right there is just heartbreaking because you know either A, Lori was making most of that stuff up, but we obviously, well if you've been following the case, you know that JJ, you know, he had certain things going on and he, you know, had behavioral situations going on. And at one point in time, apparently according to everybody, Lori was very attentive to this. And so all of a sudden Chad comes along, she runs off, and this is just, mm -mm. but what's even more just grotesque about it is that she's taking it off on this whole thing of, oh, he has an evil spirit. Oh, he said, I love Satan. I mean, come on, right? I can't roll my eyes hard enough at that. You know, I'm just like, really? You know, this is, no. And for this part right here, I do wonder with Gibb, it's like, well, didn't this seem very concerning? Uh, now, Gibb has done many interviews in the past about this, and, you know, it seemed to, to be during those, and again, I don't personally know her, so these are just my opinions, uh, but she does speak quite often about Tylee's negative behavior, Tylee's bad attitude, and then and, you know, the, this situation with JJ, I mean, this sounds like on par for what she has said in the past. I'm not saying her story has changed, but it's just concerning that you'd hear these things come from a friend's mouth in relation to their children and it not be an extreme red flag. One day, Gibb noticed JJ was having a tough time acting out and Chad took him up to the bedroom. She says Chad came in and out of Lori's townhome during the visit. On when JJ took on when Chad took JJ upstairs, Gibbs says he eventually came down and she asked Chad why his neck was red. Chad told her JJ scratched his neck. 
Now let's pause right there because that was new information to me to learn that Chad had taken him up on times like that. And so that makes me really wonder what was going on there. And it makes it even scarier to me to think of what ended up happening. And I can kind of piece it together a little bit more because I do think that Chad was influential. I think they both were, both Lori and Chad, in making the decisions to take all these people out. But it's almost like you can see now how it was happening. I'm sure, and again, I don't, this is just me going off on, you know, sofa rant here. This is not pretty proven or evidence but with this whole chad rating people and deeming this and that and blah 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 blah, blah you know i could see him coming down and being like yes jj has turned kind of a thing right when the whole thing was he and Lori just wanted to get rid of any responsibilities that they had garner money for everybody and just go on you know a la la land honeymoon trip melanie remembers the last time she saw jj it was on 9 22 19 at night and she watched alex cox carrying jj she did not see him the next day Geb, Lori said it was not the Lord's will for Chad or Lori to get a divorce from their spouses. They would be penalized and Chad would lose his exaltation with God. Now also there's money. That's really what this is all coming down to, right? Money. I don't think they believe that one bit. Now they might have said that and they might have kept that on the surface level to convince, try and convince themselves of it, but money is at the center of this too. Now, on the police visit, Gibbs says Lori told RPD that JJ was with Gibb at the movie theater. Gibbs says Lori told her to take pictures of kids running around. Jurors are looking down, taking notes, watching Gibb. Lori is taking notes as well. Blake tells Judge Boyce that she will enter exhibits, and this could take another 20 minutes plus. We are about to hear a phone call between Melanie Gibb and Lori Vallow. Blake says we can play the full call. This call has been heard before. It involves Gibb, Vallow, and Daybell. Now, this phone call that they're talking about is where, you know, Lori's basically having uh, Gibb cover up for her. Now we'll hear later where Zulima was very quick to make a lie so that uh, Lori and Chad could get together. And Gib did lie at first, but then turned back around soon thereafter and came, you know, confessed and say, hey, look, this, this, he was never here. Because I think she was probably faster than Zulima to realize something really bad wrong is going on, right? Uh, and started kind of coming clean with all this information. Nonetheless, it's very spooky and it's very sad because we know what was really going on now. Now about this phone call, the tweets we're about to go into are about that phone call. Melanie Gibb places a phone call to Lori and Chad. You can tell that it's obviously Melanie is recording this phone call and I think Alec or Lori and Chad knew right away as well. So we're just going to talk about a couple of the highlights from that phone call. So in the phone call, she says, I'm not telling anybody where he is so I can keep him as safe as possible. This is Lori referencing JJ. On the call, Gibb tells Lori that she talked to Alex about where JJ was. She says Alex told her she doesn't want to know and JJ could not be found. Now, sadly, we know at this point what was going on. And one thing that surprises me with this is how open Alex was to being kind of like that right there. That sounds very ominous. But then when you talk to Lori and Chad, they've more reeled it in. Like, we're trying to keep him safe. You know, Kay is after him. Um, we want to make sure he's okay that type of thing and it's just like oh my god they i mean they they know he's not okay right maybe in their little world they thought he was okay because they were doing him a favor to take him from this plane or i don't know what they were thinking but regardless at this point it's clear that he was no longer here now chad table speaks and says that his sister-in-law tammy's sister is part of a dark team chad says he begged tammy to go to the doctor he says his kids were all there in the home when tammy died Died. All these conspiracy theories are making me sick to my stomach, he says. Blake is asking about Melanie's visit to Lori in Rexburg. This was in September of 2019. Melanie brought her boyfriend David Warwick and they stayed at Lori's. Now, in reference to the tweet about the, you know, Tammy, uh, I think we're all seeing now that the evidence is showing that she did not die of these natural causes, right? And this was very bizarre that all this is going down and then all of a sudden Tammy mysteriously dies, you know, and, but, you know, Lori and Chad are married days later and off honeymooning. And now also in this visit where Melanie goes to uh, Rexburg, she brings her boyfriend, David. This is what they're talking about some of the last times that they would have seen JJ and a lot of this stuff went down. So that's what we're gonna be talking about here. Gibb remembers her boyfriend David waking up from a bad dream during their stay at Lori's. She then called Lori and Chad for a blessing. Gibb says she tried opening Lori's door, but it was locked. Now I want you to imagine grown adults staying in a home of their friends. Imagine yourself visiting friends. These are grown adults, okay? Your boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever, whatever, has a nightmare. You call the host on the phone in the other room you uh you know try and open their door it's locked 
how creepy is that all around right now another part to this is that melanie was allegedly you know supposed to be one of Lori's, you know kids in a past life and so this dynamic to it made me think oh my god this is even creepier where it was like a mama mama david had a bad dream make it go away blake asked gib how long Lori believed tammy was dark or possessed gib says about two weeks before tammy died and that tammy had also become suspicious about an affair between her husband and Lori. now remember how i told you earlier that if somebody was like getting in their way that their spirit was dark or they were a zombie or any of this stuff bing 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 here we go here we go here's a fresh one. Oh, this is bizarre tammy catches on to the affair and boop, what do you know she's gone dark and then she dies I'm not buying it. Gib talked to Alex Cox as well. She says he really did believe the people that they were hoping would pass away were zombies. Now we'll also hear from Zalima in a minute where she says, you know, yeah, he believed this more than anybody else. And that's what's just, I mean, again, this stuff that they came up with, I'm like, how... I understand people are naive and we have learning lessons and our own paths and stuff like this. This is next level. Okay, this stuff they're coming up with is next level. Okay, so many red flags should have gone off with anyone around this saying, what? This is not right. Now, obviously, I think both Chad and Lori are very good at grooming. I think they're very good at manipulation. And I think they're very good at gaslighting. So when these people they, they surrounded themselves with, I mean, they're picking who they can do this to, right? To get to do their dirty work, especially Alex Cox. And we see how that ended for him, which we'll talk about more here in just a minute. Now, Thomas asked about casting out de of devils. You did this with Lori, correct? And Gibbs says, correct. And Thomas says, did you ever feel like this was the wrong thing to do? And Gibbs says, it felt unusual but innocent to me. Thomas asked if innocent means praying for good and for hunger to the to end, things like that. Gibbs says that she's not, a, she's aware of. Gibbs says not that she's aware of. I mean, this is kind of a question that I'm sure the jury is just, you're dumbfounded when you first start hearing this. I remember when I watched the interviews with Gibb, uh, you know, when they released the police interviews and some of the stuff she was coming up with, I'm like, you know, now again, I'm glad she's testifying. I'm glad she is trying to help things happen now, right? Um, I mean, at least there is that. Uh, but some of the stuff, and that's not, I don't mean to just isolate her. It's just that we're talking about her right now specifically. Uh, you know, but there's plenty of other people, you know, uh, Melanie Pulowski, um, what's her name? Uh, Zulema, all these people who you're just like, what, how, what, how did we arrive here? On Brandon Boudreaux, Thomas confirms with Gibb that the group thought Brandon was a dark spirit, a part of Hitler's group in a past life. Now, when I mentioned the name Melanie Pulowski, that is Lori's niece. She was married to Brandon Boudreaux, and there his life was attempted to be taken too, and it looks like it was probably Alex. Uh, so, you know, Alex was the the little, you know, the little uh, pup that went out and did all their dirty work or whatever, the henchman, whatever you call him. Um, and so, but again, he was part of the team that was kind of like eh, what's up with melanie and Lori and all this weird stuff and then boom up there you know he's dark he's got to go and she would stand to get a good portion of money on portals gib tells thomas how Lori had a portal in her closet and chad had one on his bed that's how they could communicate thomas did you have a portal gib says oh no oh no Oh no, those were expensive i couldn't get one of those up in my place i mean i'm sitting here like <laughs> did you have a portal <laughs> not with this. The jury had to have fallen out over this one, right? They had a portal. That's how they communicate. I'm like, I'm imagining a, a, a soup can with a string on it, right? I mean, I'm just like, come on. You know, in the seriousness, oh no, I didn't have one. I was going to have one installed next summer. Let's continue. Blake asked Gibb about Tylee Ryan not liking her. She confirms that Gibb has been around other teens. Gibb says if you have been around other teenagers who have been disrespectful, Tylee would fit into that category. Now here's the thing. I was never there. I don't know these people personally. So my thing is this. The animosity that I have felt from Gibb towards Tylee throughout this entire thing with her is bizarre to me. And I do feel like there might have been some of that going on with Gibb supposedly having been like one of Lori's kids or whatever, a daughter or something in the past life you know and here this life is and Tylee's her daughter and she's like disrespectful like a teenager right um there's just something there that has never set right with me all right now let's move on to Zulema. okay buckle your seatbelts up for this if you thought that one was out there y'all 
we just getting started. Now, very quickly, let's review this one just to get us all on the same page. So Lemma is the widow of Alex Cox. He got married in Las Vegas on 11 29 19. Alex died on 12 12 19 in Zulema's Gilbert's home the day after Tammy Daybell's body was exhumed. Now we'll revisit that here in a little bit because I do think that he came to a realization of some sort of oh my god and that Chad and Lori probably kind of walked him through it's time to do your thing. So Rachel Smith says Pastinas had asked that Garrett Smith sit in the court on her behalf and she says that there should be no issue. Rachel Smith will talk about Pastinas counsel Derek Smith who will be with her. Now, Garrett has been kind of involved in this. He did sit in an interview with her. There's also been lots of other issues with him. So I was surprised to see his name pop up in here. Uh, now, I will say this. If I was personally her, specifically, and probably if I was Gib too and some of these other people, I too would want an attorney to sit, like, just kind of be there in court with me if I could, you know, do that. So, I, you know, I get it, right? I mean, especially for some of these other people where it's very questionable how much they knew and whatnot. Uh, not not sure I would have gone with Garrett Smith, but that's just me. Now about the first meeting, Zulema says that Lori spoke about having visitations with angels and that she visited with Moroni who gave her instructions. Smith wants to clarify what did this mean to Zulema. Zulema says if someone is getting visitations from such heavenly beings, then this person is very righteous and just spiritually above, the, above other people. Zulema says a witness to Jesus Christ means having a personal physical conversation with Jesus Christ. She says Lori made this testimony that this happened to her. Immediately now immediately now i've seen what i needed to see coffee dates over crocheting dates over i'm going home okay that's the only response to this if you find yourself going to visit with a new friend and they start talking about hold on i got moroni on hold i was you know hanging out with jesus christ last night you back away slowly okay you don't entertain it Smith asks Zulema about what a blessing means. At the Mesa PAP conference, which is preparing a people, Zulema says Chad told her that he would give her a blessing if she went to Lori's home. And Zulema describes going to the backyard with Lori and Chad to talk. Smith asks what about. Zulema says, I don't really remember what we were talking about. She was playing, me and Lori, basketball and asked Chad to play basketball with her. Zulema says she felt awkward. She felt like the third will and noticed that Lori was flirting with Chad. I can already see this entire thing playing out. I can see her, Lori's hair, how it was done. I can see what she was saying. I mean, I can just, this is on brand, right? And how bizarre to this to be like, you know, I've sent Charles out of town, this whole conference. I mean, she's just spinning the wheels and making her little web a web. Now when they had lunch, Zulema says Chad told her he wanted to give her some information, but Chad and Lori didn't want Melanie to know. Chad called Zulema later what her prior lives had been. Zulema says he told her about his light or dark rating system. And Zulema says Chad told her she was Lori's daughter in another life, but she had been ard, killed, and dismembered by the Mennonites. And it looks like Justin corrects himself, Lamanites, uh, it says, yeah, this is a lot. Now a couple of things here. First of all, you knew it boiled Melanie's pot to hear that whole comment about that they wanted to have a conversation but not her no right then the whole thing about her being a daughter and then also isn't it bizarre to hear how what had happened to her and then you think of the context of now right um yeah it's a lot to take in and again if you're the jury you're gonna be sitting there looking at Lori with some serious side eye two new exhibits about to be entered photo of Zulema with Melanie Gibb and Serena Sharp another photo of the three women standing back to back holding their fingers out like guns I would have given good money to see that picture can you imagine i would have crawled under the table if they had shown that in court i mean obviously they did right i would have crawled off the witness stand under the state's desk and been like just ask me the questions from here i cannot with this picture that you've just shown the focus of prosecution's questioning into Zulema's testimony is on how this group attempted to cast out evil spirits together at the request of lori vallow ZP says Alex believed in all of this more than anyone there. And this is the part I was talking about earlier where I think that, you know, everyone says this like he really believed it. He really believed it. You know, and I've always questioned how much did Chad and Lori really believe this? You know, was a sliver of, well, this is what we're saying, but we know there's this motivation. But then you run into people like Alex or Melanie or Zulema or whatever. Uh, but it, allegedly, apparently Alex, where it's like, no, he, no questions asked. He believed this stuff, right? And so that's scary and unfortunate because we'll hear and hear momentarily um, 
maybe a realization that he came to about that. So after the spirit named Ned was apparently removed according to Lori, ZP says the next day the next dark spirit had been around for hundreds of years and his name was Hiplos. Zuluma says the group did several castings on Charles Vallow. Smith asks about Alex Cox's involvement in casting out Hiplos and Zuluma says not that she can remember. And Zulema says that Lori said Charles moved to Texas because there were doctors there who help keep bodies that are possessed alive. Now again, I keep bringing this up and I probably always imagine the jury listening to this. This is just next level BS, right? I mean, what do you say to this? It's so just, ugh, right? And then the castings, and we did this with Charles Vallow. And again, there's this certain level where you just have to begin to question, you know, people like Zulema, Melanie, Plowski, all these people, you know, where you're just like, what were you thinking? I mean, like, at what point did you jump off this train? Clearly, it was too late when they did. Now, on what actually happened that day, Zulema says Lori told her she was putting JJ on Charles's car and took his phone. They got into an argument and Alex was there so he got involved. Zulema says that Alex was trying to protect his sister and Tylee came into the middle of this fight with a bat. Now Charles, Zulema says that Charles had taken the bat from Tylee and hit Alex in the back of the head with it. They wrestled and then Alex got his gun and shot Charles. Lori is sitting back swivelly and lightly back and forth. She's watching Zulema on the stand. Now this is in reference to the day that Charles Vallow was killed by Alex Cox. This was at a house. Uh, Lori house when Charles came to pick up JJ there was an interaction and um, as you hear this is what they're saying happened now we've seen the police body cam footage if you've not it's on the internet you can look it up um, Alex uh, yeah I don't believe this for a bit I believe it was a setup Alex had a little blemish on the back of his head that he probably did himself and I think if Charles went to hit him in the back of a head with a baseball bat he would have just not been there after that right I think it was an ambush and I think it's a tragic way for him to go and probably he realized in that moment that everything he had tried to warn everybody about and was screaming from the top of his lungs was going to happen was then happen. Zulema says Chad told them that Rexburg would be a place of refuge when other countries would invade the United States. Rexburg would be a place for soldiers and warriors to defend the area prepared by the church for people to come and be safe. Well let's all start packing up for Rexburg then I guess. Zulema talks about how Lori would finance her way to Rexburg, told her that she was getting social security benefits on behalf of Tylee Ryan and the 4K in Social Security for J.J. Vallow, as well as some Social Security benefits on behalf of Charles's death, not life insurance. Zulema says Lori didn't have to work. Lori was making a pretty penny. Okay, that's a lot of money, right? That's a nice income. Clearly wasn't enough for her. She wanted to keep getting more and more and more. But this is what I'm talking about. You see the motivation behind this, right? Of course, they were never going to want anyone to know what happened to some of these people who were disappearing and dying, if they could, such as the children, because she wanted to collect those benefits. Lori said Tylee had to be free. And Zulema said when she asked Lori what that meant, Lori put her hand to Zulema's face and said, Don't ask. This was during a quick visit by Zulema to Rexburg before JJ was last seen. Zulema says she started saying that JJ had been attacked by demons before moving to Rexburg and Tylee had been attacked by a demon named Hillary and that's a tragic part of that I mean you see how they were lining everything up they had laid the basis for the belief system and then when things weren't going their way someone needed to get out of the way you know Tylee's too cumbersome but you know we can't whatever this is what began to happen oh Tylee's gone dark oh JJ is possessed oh this and that and you see where this goes. Now at this time, Tammy Daybell was still alive and Chad was living in Salem with his family. Zulema says that Chad told her to lie for him and say she was speaking at a conference and wanted him there. Zulema says this was so Chad could get out of the house and see Lori. Zulema says that she did send the text and create the lie. She spent time at Lori's townhome with Chad who came over. She wanted her to move to Rexburg. They wanted her to move to Rexburg. Smith asked why they told her to move. Zulema says they told her it was her mission to help them build Zion and Rexburg. Now this is the part I find completely tragic. First of all, once it, this is what it seems to me, again these are just my opinions, uh, it seems to me that once that uh, Chad and Lori were like, oh Zulema will do what we want, and this could be for anybody, they were like, oh girl, come on, we need you in Rexburg. Why do you want me in Rexburg? You're going to help build Zion. No, you're going to help them manipulate and do things until they don't need you anymore. And then you're going to disappear or die. That's what's going to happen, Zulema. 
Chad told Zulema in August 2019 blessing that she would move to Rexburg and get married. And we know that Zulema married Alex Cox three months later. And on the Rexburg trip, Zulema said that she and Alex went to dinner. She says he was really funny and they spent time watching movies and getting to know each other. She stayed in Rexburg for two to three days. Smith asked Zulema if she remembers hearing about Tammy's death. Zulema got a call from Melanie Gibb about it. She says her reaction was confusion. I didn't know what to think. Now in regards to the marriages, you know, when we were following this case and it was going down and you start looking looking at some of the evidence of, okay, Zulema and Alex get married, and this is the connection to how they knew each other. Then there's Melanie Boudreaux, who's getting separated and married to this guy over here. All these people just married, Chad and Lori, getting married all of a sudden, and then mysteriously their spouses are dying along the way, right? Like almost immediately. Case in point, Tammy Daybell. Um, and again, I just question the part of when you hear all this going on, you see this taking place. I mean, there had to be red flags going off that this is not right. This is not how this should be going. Zulema, Z Lori told me Tammy was possessed by a demon and it was no longer her. She needed my help casting. Zulema claims to not know the name of the spirit that possessed Tammy. Smith asks if Viola sounds familiar. Yes, Zulema confirms. Now, this is the thing with the blessings and whatnot, and I know a lot of it we hear from Zulema and uh, Melanie is, you know, oh, it wasn't a physical thing, it was this, you know, and we did spells and all this kind of stuff or whatever. You know, and it's, uh, again, I, from my perspective, if you're doing that, but then also in real life, you're seeing these people have bizarre, you know, oh, she, Tammy was shot, and then, oh, a few days later, she actually died, and, oh, well, now this happened, and, oh, well, the kids are missing, and, you know, it just, it seems just so off. Zulema recalls Alex being on the phone with Chad and Lori on December 11th, 2019. The couple told him about Tammy's body being exhumed. Zulema says Alex told her, I think I'm being their fall guy. And Alex said, either I'm a man of God or I'm not. Now, this is the part I was talking about earlier, where first of all, for him to say, I think I'm being their fall guy, look at first of all, all the murders that he did, you know, for them. And God knows what else, right? Now, for him to say, either I'm a man of God or I'm not, and then to die, <sighs> You know, and Chad was on the phone with him earlier when all this went down and all this kind of stuff. I feel like he either was like a couple of things. I feel like he took his life in some way, right? Uh, poison, something, I don't know. But he either had the realization of, oh my God, this was not real. Like the what if, like the what if entered his mind. And if you had that into your mind in this case and you were involved in it, like he and Lori and Chad and whatnot, you're going to be like, what have I been a part of? This is a horror show. This is horrifying, right? Or he was still believing it. And in order to hold on to that belief, to avoid that, it was like, I'm going to take my life and take one for the team, right? Because at the end of the day, if he was alive, can you imagine the things he would be saying on the stand? I mean, in addition to probably spending the rest of his life in prison, right? Um, I mean, that's where he would be headed. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. I'm very curious to hear what you think about that specific thing down in the comment section. So let me know. Let's continue. Alex died the next day on December 12th. Police and medics responded to Zulema's home where Alex was found laying in an upstairs bathroom. And again, that was so bizarre. One of Zulema's kids was there. Didn't even really know Alex's name. I mean, it was so weird, right? The whole thing. And then there's body cam footage from that as well. And you can tell Slim is very nervous. It is not a reaction that you... And I'm not trying to say she has something to do with it specifically. But you could tell that it was like... The the lid was lifted off of this whole thing going on with, with that. And cops were peering in and being like, this, you know, what's up? Like, she's not wanting to talk and this and that. And she's worried about a lawyer. I mean, it was bad, you know. And uh, it just, again, red flag central. We are looking at the front page of the journal. Zulema described a diagram of multiple creations and multiple words that one person can come to. We see a few vertical ovals and small circles inside. Zulema is trying to explain this to the jury. If the person dies, there's a two-minute window in which a demon can inhabit the body. The original spirit goes into limbo. Now, when we talk about the ways that they can prevent this, and then you compare those to uh, Tylee and JJ, it's very scary because you're like, oh, whoa, okay, this is bad, right? This is really, they were following the line with this, you know, form of belief and taking the body out and doing this kind of a thing. Also, side note, I would love to read that journal cover 
to cover. More notes on how to cast out evil spirits and making sure the body is destroyed. Burning the body is one way. Smith asked about binding the body and Zlima says she believed there was an option like that. Now again, this is what I'm talking about when those poor children's remains were found. I mean, look at that, right? The differences in that and how they were found and how they were destroyed, it's heartbreaking. Zulema says Chad told them all about their gifts. Melanie's gift was being a gatherer. Zulema's gift was working with the elements. Serena's gift was being a powerful goddess. I'm telling you, Lori and Chad's angels, I mean, literally, if they come out with another damn Lifetime movie, they could name it that. She seemed much more confident in her answers and appeared to be in her element, explaining the light-dark scales along with her diagram on multiple creations. Now, he's speaking of Zulema and how there's a contrast in her testimony. Uh, the beginning part was maybe a little uneasy, unsure, and then she got more confident when she was talking about this stuff, which brings me to my question and wonderment of how much of this does she still believe? What of it did she really believe back then? Why is she so much more like, oh, I know this stuff because this stuff is not stuff I would be out there talking about. Like, oh yeah, I know that like the palm of my hand. Thomas says, do you believe your work on castings had a direct effect on the two children that died and the spouse that died? And Zlima says, not my work, but Chad and Lori's work did. Now here's my thing with that question. Excellent question. Part of me says who would answer yes to that, but with this group, it doesn't surprise me, right? Also, isn't it funny how with this She's like, oh no 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 not my casting no mm -mm, no mine never took they were really crappy they just didn't do nothing chad's and Lori's were good though now you know if this never happened or anything they never got caught or anything she would have taken credit for that right she would have been like oh yes oh it was all mine oh all mine right chad and Lori, who and so that's the whole thing with all of this information that comes out and they still have to continue um interview or interrogating uh i'm sorry questioning i'll get to the right correct word uh zulema i believe on tuesday she'll get back up there so lord knows i mean this testimony is just getting warmed up right um but i'm curious to hear what you think about these beliefs i mean i think the jury was probably like oh my god right like this is next level stuff this is absurdity but this brings to me at least more into focus the cultish aspect of what was going on seeing how these people and i'm talking you know melanie's uh zulema alex just bought up whatever Chad and Lori were selling and were out doing their dirty work and whatnot. Um, these classic signs of just cult behavior, right? Um, and that's what makes it scary is just how just, you know, they went around doing all these horrible things and taking lives left and right in the name of something, but what I am not sure. Now, if you are still watching, make sure to drop hearts down in the comment section for all of the victims of this absolutely horrendous uh, case. And uh, let me know what your thoughts are down in the comment section. I'm very curious to hear, especially on Alex. I'm very curious to know what do you think happened to Alex? Do you think that he had an epiphany or not? Um, do you think that he was like doing it in the way of like, I'll take the secrets to wherever land with me that type thing let me know now below um and that's it until we gather back around my little water bottle which has been off camera i'll see y'all soon